Good morning. It's lovely to be with you, to gather with you, to worship our God together. Uh, welcome to the church, especially if you're visiting for the first time. Uh, what we do is we open with a few words from the Psalms, and then I'll pray before we sing together. These words come from Psalm 16, where the psalmist says, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we ever bless you that you have given to us the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, to be my Lord, to be our Lord. And that besides him, there is nothing good because of how good he is. We thank you then for enriching our lives with the things of Christ uh, with the things of this church and with uh, so many good things that we will thank you for uh, in prayer later. But Father, we ask you to bless this time to us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake, that his name might be glorified. Amen. Turn with me then in your Bibles to Isaiah and chapter 52. We'll just have one reading this morning and we'll read again later. But Isaiah chapter 52. And we're going to start at verse 13, and we'll read into chapter 53. There's a few different people speaking uh, through this little passage. You have, on one hand, you have God the Father is speaking about his Son, the Lord Jesus. On the other hand, you have Isaiah the prophet speaking about the Lord Jesus. And so these two speakers will interchange as we read through. So just, just to be aware of that, it might make it a bit easier to understand and follow. So Isaiah 52 and from verse 13. Behold, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond any human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. 
and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. May God bless that reading to us. So we come now to the sermon where I get to speak to you for a little bit from Acts chapter 8, and then we'll have the baptisms. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 8, I'll read this little section uh, to you from verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. Excuse me. So Acts chapter 8 and from verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, that's one of the followers of the Lord Jesus, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in the charge of all the treasury of Kandak, queen of the Ethiopians. This man, the Ethiopian, had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began at that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, The spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Did you have your cereal this morning? If you had your cereal, are you one of these weirdos that doesn't have milk? I think everyone has milk in their cereal, don't they? You go to the fridge. Now, what's on your fridge? On your fridge, before you open it to get your milk, you'll see magnets. Now, if you take those magnets off the fridge, I presume you have magnets on your fridge. What happens if you try to push those magnets together is that they will usually stick together. But if you turn one around and try to put them together the wrong way, you just can't get them to stick together. It's like, no matter how close they get, something is keeping them apart. And that's a little bit like what life was like for this Ethiopian man in his chariot on this day in Acts 8. 
Where do you think he's from, the Ethiopian eunuch? He's from Ethiopia. And he had gone down to Jerusalem, which is far away, to worship, it says there in verse 27. It seems that this Ethiopian, a man from Africa, the north of Africa at the time, was converted and became a sort of Jew. He was going to Jerusalem to worship. You see, his whole life had become about getting close to God. He lingered around God and the things about God. He bothered with his people and he read his word. He took long periods of leave from his very important job in Ethiopia to go to Jerusalem and worship at religious feasts. You know, he will have paid for that privilege. He would have paid the taxes to get there and taxes again when he gets there. He would have paid for the sacrifices that he then burns up in an offering. Maybe he bought new clothes and dressed like a Jew. Maybe he cut his hair and held it like Jews have their hair. It appears, from what we've read, that he even learned Greek so that he could read the scriptures. He even bought his own copy. Now, it's not like today where you can pick up Bibles for 99p or whatever. Back then, you'd spend an arm and a leg to try and get any old book because they all had to be copied out by hand. He's spending huge amounts of money to have his own Bible. It's likely that he was a fully-fledged convert which means, becoming a Jew, he will have had to cut off the most sensitive part of his body and throw it away so that he could get close to God. There was nothing that this man wouldn't do to get close. But like trying to put magnets back together, back to back, there was always this, diff, this distance there was always a gap, something keeping him away. You see, he's not Jewish. He doesn't speak Hebrew, as far as we can tell. He doesn't live in Judea, where the Jews live. And he knows in his heart and his mind that he sins. And that these sins grieve God. And on top of all that, he's a eunuch. The poor fellow. He had another bit of him chopped off, which meant that he couldn't even get that close to God in the temple and things like that. There were rules about that sort of thing. All of these things kept him away. As close as he would draw, he could never get near. Now, isn't that the plight of all humanity? We draw close to things, we try to understand things, but we're always doomed to float around the periphery and never really understand what's the truth. We can't really penetrate to the very centre of matters, to the heart of things, and get it. There's always more questions. It might be how you live now, or maybe in years gone by, where you come to church, to draw near to God. You read the Bible to draw near to God. You prayed. You spent time with Christians. Maybe you were even baptized. Maybe you even became a church member. I don't know. Drawing close to God with all the different ways that you could, but there was always a distance, always that wretched gap. I know what that was like myself, do you? Drawing close, but always a gap. A knowledge that you just don't belong where the Lord is. Because of the sins in ourselves that we do, the, the rotten things that we think and say, the things that we act on, the things that we don't do that we should do, and besides all of those things, that massive mountain of sins, who we are. Not just that we sin, but that we are sinners. Through and through, rotten to the core. We just don't belong. There's this gap. Now there's a specific aspect I want to focus on here for this eunuch. And that comes up in verse 28. He's reading the prophet Isaiah. That's a book that we have in our Old Testament. We read the section not long ago. You know, we really can't draw any closer 
to God than to press our ears against his mouth and listen for his voice. That's as close as we can get to hear him speak. I want you to think now of Terry and Tina. Terry works in an office and uh, on the desk next to him is Tina and he loves Tina. He thinks she's absolutely gorgeous and he gets to see her every day. And uh, although he gets to sit beside her all the time, he's not content. He sees her every day. He even gets to shake her hand and pass her in the corridor and eat lunch with her and so forth. But if only she would speak to him, then he could get to know her. You see, we can draw near to God in many, many, many ways that he has given us by his sheer grace. But like the Ethiopian, we can get closest when we listen to his word. Not content to float around the periphery, we want to hear what he has to say to me. But here's the problem. When Terry finally gets the uh, courage to ask Tina out on a date, she opens up her mouth and it turns out she speaks a different language. Get in. He can't understand what she says. He's hamstrung from the very beginning. And here's the Ethiopian reading through Isaiah, reading the word of God who he tries all of his eff- with all of his might to draw close to, and he can't understand. He doesn't even know who is speaking. You get that, don't you? He asked Philip, who is speaking? The prophet? For himself? Or for someone else? Do you ever have that experience with the Bible? Reading it, reading it, reading it, trying to understand. But it's like it's another language. I just don't get it. I don't know where to start. I'm trying to listen for the words of God. But there's this gap. That's the thing about the word of God. It is where we draw closest to God to hear him speak to us. But so often it's that which pushes back the hardest. Reminding us of that horrible gap. What we need, my friends, is someone to explain it to us. Verse 31. How can I understand unless someone explains it to me or guides me? Enter Philip. Philip, he knows who is speaking. In fact, he knows the person who is doing the speaking. He understands what he reads and he's going to tell the Ethiopian now what God says and that's my privilege today as well like uh, like like Philip now I get to open up the word of God and tell you what God says to you who are drawing near to God and there's always this distance to you who listen for his voice but don't understand let's read what the Ethiopian was reading and see if we can understand I'll I'll read it to you again then, this little section in Isaiah, and see if you can understand. I'll just read a few verses. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 8. This is what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, but we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you understand? When we draw near to God and listen, what does he say? You know, when God opens his mouth, he always, always tells us about his son, the Lord Jesus. Always. This is so true that in the Bible, sometimes Jesus, the son of God, is given another name. He's called the word of God. Because whenever God speaks, he speaks Jesus to us. The Ethiopian was there, drawing near to God, listening for God's voice, and he heard about Jesus. 
See there in verse 35, starting at this passage, Philip preached Jesus to him. God is always preaching to humanity, to all of us, about his son, the Lord Jesus. If only we would listen. If only we would understand. What does God say about his son, the Lord Jesus, then, in this passage in Isaiah that the Ethiopian was reading? Philip told the Ethiopian, this is what you're reading. God has sent Jesus into the world to bear our sin, to carry it, to take our guilt away from ourselves and to himself on the cross. More than that, not just our sin, not just our guilt and all that rottenness, but all of that distance, all of that gap, every disqualification that puts a gap between us and God, Jesus will take that to You know, on the cross, one of the things he cried out while he was dying there for sinners, he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was this horrible gap and he took it to himself as well. More than that, not just our sin and our guilt and that distance and all that disqualification that keeps us and God apart. He takes the punishment that we all earn upon ourselves because of our sins. He bears that himself as well. He was pierced for our transgressions. You know, it's true that he became upon the cross all that we are. He took our flesh He took our blood, he took our body, he became human. He took our sin, he became a sinful human, he became a sinner for us. God bore in himself the curse upon sin. He took it all, everything rotten about us, everything rotten about this world, he took it all within himself, Philip says. Now imagine the Ethiopian hearing that. Philip says, no matter what you do, you can cut off your arms and legs. You can spend all of your money. You can go to Jerusalem and move in. You can live inside the temple. You can do whatever you want, but you just can't get close to God. Not just your sins that keep you away from him, but who you are. Your sinfulness, your crookedness. You can't do anything about it. But God has given his own son to carry it all away. You know, it's not just the Ethiopian who gets the privilege of hearing that message. It's you and me. We get to hear from the scriptures, from Philip, from God himself, that no matter what we do, the living God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will always be far away and alien and foreign to us. Our sins, they anger him. They grieve and offend him. We can't be rid of them. Even in our own selves, we have this lilt and twist that takes us away from him. We can't draw close. But he so loves this world anyway that he gives his own son so that if we put our trust in him, he will take all of our sins away And we can be drawn near to God. He has drawn near to us. It's not that we want to be saved, but that he comes in and saves us. It's not that we want to get close, but that he comes in to us. For God so loved the world. Do you know that verse? That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you understand? Do you understand that? Why is it the Christians always go on about the cross then? Why is it that so many people wear it around their necks, or get it drawn onto their bodies, or have it put up in their churches and their homes? Because at the cross, that most cosmic, that most enormous, that most universal event happened where God, the Son, bore in his body all of our sin and all of the consequences of it. How do you get over realizing that? How can you get over understanding the truth of that event 
It's going to become the centre of your life. And it did for this Ethiopian man. Everything that estranges us from God, Jesus Christ will take away if we believe in him. One of the questions that I asked Jill and Pam in the last few weeks was, um, where does your sin go? Upon becoming a Christian, upon putting your faith in Christ, upon confessing your sin, where does it go? They both answered rightly. It doesn't vanish. God doesn't just snap his fingers and make it go away. He doesn't turn a blind eye as if it doesn't exist, because that would be unjust. But rather, when we confess our sin, God will take it. He takes it to himself. Our sin goes to him. In the person of his son, Jesus Christ, upon the cross, he absorbs our sin and he dies for our sin. It kills him. And then, now, finally, with that gap removed, we are brought near to God. We know him no longer as God, but our Father who art in heaven. We can love him, we can know him in Jesus Christ his Son because he has revealed him to us. We can live eternal life even now. The Ethiopian heard that and he understood. He read the scriptures, he understood that it was about Jesus. Do you hear God's voice and understand? It seems that the Ethiopian had heard about Christians before. They were making a right old racket in Jerusalem at the time. He had heard about baptism because he mentions it himself, doesn't he? So he's heard these things before. But now is when his ears are opened to understand that God is speaking to him about his son. Have you come to church before Maybe you've come more times than I have. Maybe you've heard dozens of sermons like this one. Maybe you've read the Bible cover to cover. But maybe now, maybe now you understand that God is speaking to you about Jesus, his son, and what he has done for you. So that you can be forgiven of all of your sin. And be brought near to God because of Christ. Not by you drawing near to him. But by him drawing near to you. Not because he want, you want to be saved. But because he wants you to be saved. That he saves sinners like us. The Ethiopian then understanding this. He, he wants to be baptised. He's seen the light. The lights have turned on. He gets it. He realises now that God has spoken to him about his son and all that the cross means. He gets it. And he wants to be baptised. And Philip says, if you believe, then you may be baptised. It's a bit of a strange question, isn't it? Why does he ask that? The Ethiopian has just realised the truth. God has spoken to him about his son. He gets it now. He knows who Jesus is and what he's done and how this all works. He he gets it. Why does Philip have to ask him if you believe? The Ethiopian knows, but knowing the truth and believing it are different things. I know that McDonald's will sell you a cheeseburger for 99p. But I can't quite believe that that's true. Do you know what I mean? That's amazing. A cheeseburger for 99p. I know that it's true, but I can't believe it. It's just too good to be true. You know, some people think like that about this good news. About this gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that it's true, but can we believe it? You know that God loves you enough... To give his own son. That you might be brought near to him. You know that Jesus would rather die for your sin. Than watch you die for your sin. You know that if you confess your sin. He will forgive you of it all. And give you eternal life. You know that God has given his son. And with that he will give us everything else. 
But will you believe it? Will you trust him? Let me just read this verse to you from uh, another part of the Bible called Ephesians, and then we'll sing, uh, I'll pray and then we'll sing and move into the baptisms. This comes from Ephesians in chapter 2. I'll just read this verse to you. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, how can we possibly thank you for the truth of this gospel? We ever bless you, Lord God, for the gift of Jesus Christ to this world, that we who live in perpetual darkness and sin, who can't draw anywhere near to you because of our own crookedness, that we might be forgiven and washed and made completely clean and given your Holy Spirit and a home in glory and membership even of your church. Oh, Father, you have lifted us from the gutter to the highest heaven. Oh, give us the grace and the faith, we pray, to believe that this is true. We ask these things for Jesus' glory's sake. Amen.